Hello again, and welcome back to FSD TV. I'm your host, Mark Sunny, and today we have Kim Bass back again, who's continuing the story of PAX. And today we're going to learn war is never a good thing. So, Kim, take it away. Hi, everybody. It's Mrs. Bass, and I'm back with PAX. We are going to be returning to find out what we're what Peter's up to. So are you ready, Gage? I have my own little miniature packs here and my tissues, just in case, because, yeah, just in case. Chapter 28. Peter traveled south for almost an hour, feeling certain that Pax had traveled the same route. When he emerged from the woods, he stopped. A vast meadow sloped down for at least a mile before flattening into another mile of wide green floor. At the base of that, the land rose hundreds of feet in jagged steps, as if chopped with a giant hoe, and beyond that, rolling to the horizon, was the forested plateau that hid the gorge. Since waking, he traveled nine hours without thinking of rest once, but now the stunning immensity of the distance ahead drained what was left of his energy. He dropped his pack and fell to the ground, nine hours of the, gripping the crutch handles, had stiffened his hands into claws. He forced them open and felt the raw palms split. They'd blistered the day before, broken open and blistered again. He poured cool water from his thermos over the hot pulp of his palms and set to work picking the out shreds of tire rubber. Then he eased his extra pair of socks over his hands and looked out again. A movement halfway down the valley caught his eye. Something trotted in bouncing dips between two trees. Fox movement. Peter rose to his knees. Pax! There it was again, but no, whatever there was, that whatever was there was tan, not red. Coyote, maybe. The thought was a shot of adrenaline, and suddenly he was moving again. Pax slamming against his back, crutches pistoning down the hill all the way to the valley bottom in just half an hour, and then sinking into the boggier ground there, muddy and slower, but still moving. And then a 10-foot sheer rock wall loomed in front of him. The cliffs were a lot taller than they had appeared from across the valley. Before he could second-guess himself, Peter hurled his pack and then his crutches up and heard them clatter onto a stony ledge. He wedged his fingers into a crevice and pulled. His cast scraped along the rough rock face, but his arms were strong from Vola's training, and he levered himself onto a shallow foothold. From there, he reached for a jutting tree, then another crack in the rock, and then he heaved himself over the first ledge. It took an hour to climb the steep rise that way, crutches and pack first, and dragging himself after. When he reached the crest, panting and sweat-soaked, he fell to the ground under a tall pine. He drained his thermos in one swallow and ate the last of the ham sandwiches. He opened Vola's second packet. Peanut butter. P Peter's throat closed. He remembered the first time Pax had found an empty jar in the trash. He'd squeezed his snout in so deep it had gotten stuck, and Peter had laughed until it hurt. He stuffed the sandwich back into the bag, wishing he'd found it the day before and tossed it to the dogs scavenging the dumpsters and got up again. It was almost six o'clock and he had a ways to go still. As he traveled, the memories of those hungry-eyed animals accompanied him, darting and retreating like accusing ghosts. He wished he could tell them that he knew how it felt to have the one person who had loved you and taken care of you suddenly vanish. How the world suddenly seemed dangerous after that. He had lost a parent. How many kids this week, he wondered, had woken up to find their worlds changed that way. Their parents gone off to war, maybe never coming home. That was the worst, of course, but what about the smaller losses? How many kids missed their older brothers or sisters for months at a time? How many friends had to say goodbye? How many kids went hungry? How many had to move? How many pets had they had to leave behind to fend for themselves? And why didn't anyone count those things? People should tell the truth about what war costs, Vola had said. Weren't those things the cost of war too? With a start, Peter found that the dark was falling around him. A little panicked, he should have been looking for a good place to settle for the night. He spun around, his left crutch shot out onto a patch of loose stones. He fell onto it hard 
and heard a crisp snap. For an instance, he feared rib, but the sound had been wood. He landed, still gripping the top of his crutch. Six feet away was its bottom shank. Diable man, it came out naturally, a satisfying word. He tried out some other swears and they felt pretty good too. But the way the darkening woods absorbed his shouts without a response made him uneasy, so he stopped. He didn't have the luxury of venting anyway. He had a crutch to repair and not much light left. All around him, trees shot out hardwood limbs that he could tape to the broken pieces as a splint, but he had no hatchet to cut them. As he drew the bat out of his pack so he could find the tape, he realized that the solution was in his hand. He aligned the crutch pieces, laid the bat over them, and then began winding the tape. When he was finished, he tested the crutch with his full weight. It held strong and solid. He wished he could tell Vola she'd been right. He needed her bat on his journey. He knelt by his pack again. The accident had been warning enough. He pulled out the things he needed to make camp for the night, then scraped a bowl in the dirt and filled it with a pile of twigs and dried grass. He touched a match to it and a little fire crackled to life. Peter held his jackknife over the flames until he figured it was sterilized. Then, gritting his teeth, and slid open the new blisters that had formed on his palms. The pain made him gasp, but he eased on some of Vola's salve and took deep breaths until it numbed. The herb smell swept him back to her kitchen with a rush, and he wondered if she was there now. How was she managing without that heavy leg to anchor her? Before he put his knife away, he held it up. The last of the firelight danced along its blade. He remembered the first time he'd seen Vola's knife, how shocked he'd been when she had gouged a chip of wood off her leg. Peter tugged up his jeans. He pressed the flat of the knife against his calf and tried to imagine slicing off a nugget of flesh because it offended him, because it wasn't perfect. A coyote howled then, and a second answered from a distance. Peter shivered. He turned the blade until the cool edge creased his flesh, then jerked it up. The slice was only half an inch, but its sting was fierce. There were advantages he could see to being made of wood. The cut beaded up. As the dark blood began to drip, he drew it into the shape of a leaping fox. With his fingernail, he pricked out a pointed nose, then two ears, a wild smear of his thumb for the brush. Pax, tomorrow. A red fox blood vow. And that ends chapter 28. Wow. Kim, thank you so much for continuing our story, and we can't wait as we get to the exciting conclusion coming up soon. On behalf of everyone here at FSD-TV, my name is Mark Sunny, and keep reading, Fullerton. Fullerton.